Uzbekistan among the Central Asian states is probably the least transparent in terms of how it's governed. Um, when you talk to people in Uzbekistan, they will claim that, oh yes, it's governed by a group of you know, interest groups that might be referred to as clans or um, you know, tribal groups or regional interest groups. But when you actually uh, press them on it, they can't really give you the details. And I think that's in part because, uh, unlike Kazakhstan, where mm, the political and economic elite are very visible, uh, a lot of them have, they, they're on the Forbes list of billionaires, uh, they have assets on the London Stock Exchange. The elite in Uzbekistan is somewhat uh, hidden. Um, obviously, uh, from the outside, it looks that as if the, the government is essentially ruled by a strongman leader and President Karimov, the parliament doesn't really have any, any significant power. Um, they basically uh, rubber stamp approval of legislation. They don't really write legislation. They don't um, really, they, they don't vote it down. <laughs> so, so essentially it, the, the parliament is more of a, um, uh, more of a, a show institution um, to show that there's some kind of, um, some kind of democratic process going on in the governance. Uh, the different political parties uh, are also equally controlled um, and don't really compete in any kind of um, any kind of way, even whether in elections or in the competition of ideas. They don't really present different ideals of the way uh, the Uzbek state should be governed. But that being said, um, one has to believe that in addition to the president, um, a very important role is played by the security organs uh, and the army. Uh, unlike most Central Asian states, Uzbekistan has a very strong military. And because of that, people have often speculated that, you know, it's the kind of state where one might see a future of military coups and military rule as people have seen in parts of Latin America and Asia. Um, and, and that's not really what people forecast for other Central Asian states because the other Central Asian states don't really have that strong military. So um, there is certainly there's certainly kind of different constellations of power in the Uzbek elite, uh, including around the president, including regional power groups, including um, the military and the security organs, that all have some kind of say in how it's how the country is run. Um, now, the nuts and bolts of how decisions are made, I think that's a question that's uh, anything but transparent. entire history of um, Islamic resistance to Karimov state has um, mostly been in the Fergana Valley, beginning in the early 90s with um, the creation of this Adilat party, um, which um, became the basis for the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. But um, this party initially um, set up, they, they took over the local government building um, in the city of Namangan and um, essentially created their own mini republic. Um, and, and this really scared Karimov and his government and they cracked down very um, aggressively on, on this movement, eventually forcing them out of the country. And that was kind of the genesis of this Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, which has, to varying degrees, continued to uh, operate since the, since the mid to late 90s, um, mostly out of Afghanistan, well, first Tajikistan, then Afghanistan, and now allegedly out of uh, uh, the tribal areas of Pakistan. And, you know, this 
this has, uh, you know, wh whether it's whether it's partly imagined by the authorities in in Tashkent, it has become for them their their primary enemy. Uh, one thing that I think is often overlooked by Western feminist understanding Uzbek women is the complex role, the complex relations within the family. Um, generally, within a, an extended family in a rural area of Uzbekistan, uh, it is a woman who runs the household. Um, and it's in, in particularly if you are the mother hen of the family, um, it's a very powerful position. And in fact, the most disempowered position in an extended rural Uzbek family is usually um, the new wife of the mother's son. Um, and, and that kind of the hierarchy kind of goes down by age. Um, and that, um, you know, so the youngest wife in a family um, of sons is responsible for more work, um, has to have more deference to the mother in law. Um, and is generally um, has a much more difficult life. Um, now, one of the things that you see that kind of contradicts the idea of women being limited in the house uh, and the family that speaks worse of women's conditions is you do see women um, constantly picking cotton. Um, they are they are involved in all kinds of heavy agricultural labor. Um, if you go in the Fergana Valley, there's a, a traditional silk factory that is essentially all women sitting in um, a very, um, very difficult conditions on looms, um, making traditional silk. Um, so there's certainly um, some aspects uh, of life that bring women outside the household that makes it um, I would say uh, makes their lives more difficult because then they're also responsible for um, what's going on at the household level. Uzbekistan has become, has become a place, uh, a home of labor migrants working outside the country and mostly men and you see a lot of men going to Russia but I remember uh, traveling to Uzbekistan in 2000 um, and speaking to a local government official um, in the Horezm area from the unemployment office and he was telling me that even at that time they were they were signing agreements with companies in South Korea and elsewhere to bring Uzbek laborers outside the country um, to, the, to work in, in factories in other countries. So what does that have to do with Uzbek women? It, well, it means that there's a lot of women who are responsible for families at home and um, without the aid of a husband. And um, they may or may not have access to um, good remittances from their husband's work. Uh, and this, this I think, is, is you know, really one of the major social issues that Uzbekistan faces now. And that's going to be one of the things that um, I think will define um, a lot of the livelihoods of people in the country for the um, upcoming decade in terms of how they deal with migrant labor issues and how um, remittances can translate into families being able to uh, make ends meet. You had a local movement, uh, much like what I described earlier um, as being uh, the type of movement that the Uzbek government is scared of, you know, a, a tightly knit local movement with some religious connotations um, that isn't necessarily expressing itself as being anti-state or anti-ruling uh, elite, but is providing an alternative to state structures in terms of getting things done. Now, um, this was uh, this Akramiya 
group, which was, a, you know, in a lot of ways, a very unique, um, homegrown Islamic sect um, that was very focused on the ideal of entrepreneurial activity. And um, the people were very focused on um, that one should lead, lead a, a moral and clean life and that should include entrepreneurial activity and from the fruits of entrepreneurial activity that should include also charitable activity uh, to help the community which of course all sounds great um, but in that the Uzbek government certainly saw a threat um, and they had arrested several members of this organization um, and this is where things get murky. Uh, there was, first, for several days there were protests outside the courthouse while these people were being tried, and the people in these protests included hmm, people, I guess, who might profess to be Akramiists, you know, who believed in um, these people's uh, um, ideas and by a lot of reports also included people who were just sympathetic maybe from the community these people had done good charitable activities in their community built roads um, you know helped fund schools and all kinds of things and um, then essentially um, it seems that there was a jailbreak and several of these people um, got out of prison um, while they were awaiting trial. Um, and it's not clear how this jailbreak happened, um, uh, whether, you know, there was some um, involvement of people in the penal system who allowed it to happen. Um, there seems to have been some weapons involved in terms of getting these people out. Um, and I think also during the, the jailbreak, um, uh, people got access to weapons um, from inside the jail. And so the next day there was a large protest by these people uh, in the center of the city, and they took over um, the Andijan uh, local government building, much like had happened in Namangan back in the early 90s. Um, and they did have weapons, um, and they were ha holding this large open meeting where people were um, venting uh, their complaints about the Uzbek government. And um, this was somewhat unprecedented uh, for Uzbekistan after the mid-1990s. Um, you saw some of the stuff right after the fall of the Soviet Union, but after that you just didn't see this kind of political behavior. Um, and a lot of journalists went down there and were, were covering this and were waiting to see what would happen next. Uh, and the protesters wanted um, President Karimov to come down and address them and um, speak to their grievances um, and speak to the grievances uh, they had with the arrest of these people. And then what happened next is there did arrive um, people from Tashkent, but um, if, if the president was uh, among those who arrived, he was never um, visible on the ground. But what did arrive were helicopters and tanks and um, a, an enormous amount of people were presumably killed. Um, and uh, it would seem without any kind of uh, self-defense. Um, and this has been a real bone of contention. The Uzbek government has really tried to offer one narrative of what happened. They play down the number of people who were killed. Human rights groups have offered much higher figures. Um, there was discussion of having a, an independent investigation into what happened that never really came to fruition. The Russian government sent down people to do an investigation of what happened and, and they came out saying that 
uh, the Uzbek government had used appropriate force and that, that the state was, the state security and national security was under risk. Um, but most Western governments uh, criticized Uzbekistan heavily for this and, and, saw, and, and many human rights groups said that this was the worst massacre um, of essentially a peaceful protest since uh, Beijing, um, the student protests in Beijing in 1989.